in Santa Rosa County on the Gulf Coast of Florida, spirits were lifted with the news that a new cap might keep the crude from polluting the water. Yet just as BP robots were attaching the new, tighter-fitting cap, the Obama administration was issuing a new moratorium on deep water offshore drilling, figuratively snubbing its nose at a federal appeals court's decision to reject the government's effort to restore its original moratorium after it was first blocked last month by U.S. District Judge Martin Feldman and effectively tightening the noose around the region's economic neck. Obama appointee Interior Secretary Ken Salazar said in announcing the new moratorium, I am basing my decision on evidence that grows every day of the industry's inability in the deep water to contain a catastrophic blowout, respond to an oil spill, and to operate safely. Oh, really, Mr. Salazar? Well, we here at the Center for Individual Freedom aren't so sure of the administration's intentions. We question whether the Obama administration is attempting to punish others for the failures of BP, a company that has long suffered from an abysmal safety record relative to its peers, all while enjoying a cozy relationship with the Obama administration. Here are some facts to consider. President Obama was the leading recipient of political contributions from BP employees in the last election. President Obama received five times more money from BP than did Republican leaders in Congress combined. Obama administration appointee Sylvia Baca is in the delicate position as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Land and Minerals Management with cleaning up the devastating oil spill created by her former employer, BP. Last year, Obama nominated Stephen Coonan, BP's chief scientist, to Undersecretary for Science in the Department of Energy. At the same time that the Obama administration continues to try to universalize, penalize, and demonize the entire oil industry for BP's failures, America is experiencing another crude awakening. As Senator John Barrasso recently stated, the administration's actions appear to be based on ideology instead of what's best for the country. We have failed to act with the sense of urgency that this challenge requires. The time to embrace a clean energy future is now. Now is the moment for this generation to embark on a national mission. In the slick of it all, local politicians are offering real solutions in the wake of the administration's questionable intentions. I, I think it's a little bit of a dubious argument. You know, uh, the sense of urgency, yeah, we probably need to have a sense of urgency uh, developing green technologies, but at best, it's going to be at least 20 years before those technologies are good enough and viable enough to take out into the marketplace in a in mass produced uh, sort of way. Uh, so it's kind of a, a roundabout way in my mind to bring us back to cap and trade. I mean, that's an argument that Congress really doesn't even want to take up, but it seems like that's going to be a backdoor way to bring that in. And frankly, the, the, the thing that makes more sense, uh, because this country is dependent on oil, we're way too dependent on foreign oil, which seems uh, a, just a little bit crazy to me as well. Why don't we go to Anwar, relocate a couple of caribou, uh, and, and get a well that's dug up there in one of the largest deposits uh, in oil, and the largest deposits of oil that we've ever seen in history, and uh, the next time we have an oil spill, we can drive to it instead of having to go out 50 miles offshore and a mile below the, sea sur the, the surface of the sea with remote control submarines that, uh, that have a really hard time operating in those kinds of conditions. Uh, Anwar just seems like a logical choice. It buys you time. You'll get your green technology. Everybody will be happy in the end. Finally, some intelligent thoughts on reclaiming the American dream. That's this week's Freedom Minute.